Everybody's doing it. I will bless thee, O Lord. I will bless thee, O Lord. With a heart of thanksgiving, I will bless thee, O Lord. With my hands lifted up and my mouth filled with praise, with a heart of Thanksgiving, I will bless thee, O Lord. I will bless thee, O Lord. I will bless thee, O Lord. With a heart of thanksgiving, I will bless thee, O Lord. With my hands lifted up. Jesus Christ is Lord. 
course, was over at Troas, where the Spirit directed him by vision to come over to Macedonia. He came over to where we were yesterday. Uh, at Philippi was the first beginning of the gospel in Europe. He left Philippi under pressure, having been imprisoned and uh, beaten. Uh, he then uh, came on to uh, Thessaloniki, and uh, there he again, uh, the Jews raised up uh, a stirring against him. He had to leave Thessaloniki under the cover of darkness, come to Berea, and at Berea, uh, as he was having success, the Jews from Thessaloniki came on down to Berea, gave him a bad time there, so Paul uh, left under the uh, cover of darkness again, made his way down to Athens, but he left Timothy and Silas there in Berea to strengthen the brethren. He was there uh, for just a very short period, perhaps less than uh, two weeks. And so he left them there to strengthen the new believers. But he came down to Athens where we'll be going after this. And so we're reversing the order just a little bit today in that we're coming to Corinth before we're going to Athens. And we'll cover the Athens part when we get there. But Paul then came on to Corinth. And uh, he probably, uh, first of all, looked for a place to work. And uh, being a tent maker, uh, he found this couple, uh, Jews, who had recently come from Rome uh, because Claudius, the emperor, had expelled all of the Jews out of Rome. And so Priscilla and Aquila had come to Corinth and they set up their business here. Priscilla and Aquila are interesting. They came to Corinth. When Paul left Corinth, they went with Paul over to Ephesus. And from Ephesus, uh, they started a church in their home, a home Bible studies, grew into a church. And when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said, Priscilla and Aquila greet you. Uh, then Priscilla and Aquila did end up again back in Rome, uh, interestingly enough. And so uh, when Paul writes to the Romans, he tells them to greet Priscilla and Aquila. So uh, interesting couple and traveled around and wherever they went, uh, they shared the gospel and opened up their home uh, to work. Now, here in Corinth, uh, as far as archaeological discoveries, uh, there's a very interesting uh, discovery here in Corinth that was made in just the last few years. And uh, this uh, discovery uh, was of a pavement, and on the pavement it uh, said it was dedicated to the city uh, by Erastus, who was the city treasurer. When Paul was writing to the Romans from Corinth, uh, he said, Gaius, my host, and the whole church that is of Corinth greets you, Erastus, the Chamberlain of the city greets you. And, and they have found just recently the pavement uh, with Erastus' inscription uh, donated to the city by Erastus, the city treasurer. And so that's uh, uh, just another confirmation of the scriptures from uh, the archaeologist Spade uh, where they've uncovered uh, this interesting pavement and the inscription on it. Now, as Paul was here in Corinth, uh, he, of course, as was his custom, went into the synagogue on the Sabbath days, and he was reasoning with them, the Jews, showing them from the scriptures that their concept of the reigning Messiah was correct but incorrect. In other words, he was showing them both aspects of the Messiah. One of the problems and the reasons why the Jews rejected Jesus is that their concept of the Messiah was as a reigning king. And this was the concept the disciples had. And, and they were having problems all the way through uh, with the idea that Jesus uh, was going to be crucified. In fact, when at Caesarea Philippi, when they first acknowledged that you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, it was then he began to say, and yes, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'll be turned over to the Gentiles. They'll crucify me. 
but the third day I will rise again. And Peter began to rebuke him. He said, Lord, no, 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 don't want that. that be that far from thee. Uh, because the idea of the Messiah suffering and dying was totally foreign to the Jewish thought. They were looking for their Messiah to come and to overthrow the Roman government and to set up the kingdom of God here on earth. And the thought or the idea of a suffering Messiah was totally foreign uh, to their whole concept, though it was in the scriptures and, and though it was right there. Psalm 22, Jeremiah uh, talk about, uh, they point out my beard and so forth. And in Isaiah where he speaks about in the 53rd chapter, uh, despised and rejected, Psalm uh, 118 and so many uh, of the uh, scriptures concerning the suffering of the Messiah. What the Jews did was that they spiritualized those scriptures. Uh, they gave them spiritual interpretations and thus they lost the meaning completely by the spiritual interpretation of those scriptures. And so Paul was showing in the scriptures concerning the Messiah uh, the scriptures that spoke with his suffering, the scriptures that spoke of his death. And, and he was coming in the synagogue and, and just laying the groundwork in the synagogue, giving them a different perspective of the Messiah. Now, he was waiting for Paul, uh, Timothy and Silas to catch up with him here. And when Timothy and Silas finally caught up with him, then Paul boldly proclaimed, Jesus is the Messiah. And of course, that's when the division began to come because there were so many who were just in their minds prejudiced against Jesus. And uh, Paul was perhaps, and for good cause, a little concerned uh, because of the reaction. And the Lord told Paul, now speak boldly there. Don't be afraid. Don't hold back. I have many people in this city. So you're sitting in, this, uh, in the area where Corinth, and at one time God had many people in this city. And uh, it was uh, a, an encouragement to Paul, don't be afraid, speak up. He had reason to be afraid. He was beaten in Philippi. He had to escape out of Thessaloniki. He had to escape out of uh, Berea. And the reception in Europe had not been uh, the kindest kind of reception for Paul's ministry. Uh, and usually it ended in riots. And so uh, here he is in Corinth, and you think, wow, you know, in the cultured cities here, kicking me out and beating me and, and all, this wild city of Corinth, you know, what would happen here? Uh, Corinth was such a wild city that whenever they would, in, a, in their Greek plays, show a Corinthian, they would always show him as drunk. Uh, it was just uh, the way they looked at Corinth. And to live like a Corinthian was a phrase that they would use. And it was a phrase that spoke of a person that was totally rotten, totally immoral. They say, oh, you know, the guy at the bottom, they say, he lives like a Corinthian. Uh, and in that kind of an environment, the gospel came. Now, when uh, actually Paul was preaching there in the synagogue, uh, the chief ruler of the synagogue uh, believed on the Lord. We read that uh, Crispus, in verse 8 of chapter 18 of Acts, the chief ruler of the synagogue believed on the Lord with all of his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing the word, believed and were baptized. Then the Lord encouraged Paul in the vision, Don't be afraid, for I am with you, and no man will set his hand upon you to hurt you. I have many people in this city. Whenever the Lord said, don't be afraid, throughout the scriptures, his cure for fear was always the consciousness of his presence. David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, I am thy God. God's cure for fear is the consciousness of his presence. And if God be for me, who can be against me? So the Lord said, fear not, I am with thee. Now, uh, he continued for 18 months here in Corinth. And at that time, uh, Galileo was the deputy 
of Achaia, which is this southern portion of Greece at that time. And he has sort of gotten a bad rap uh, from uh, many people because of a misunderstanding of the scripture here. Seneca, who was the brother of Galileo, said that there was never a kinder man who lived. He said that uh, if anybody loved Galileo to the utmost of their ability, they didn't love him enough. And uh, that he was uh, kinder to the meanest men than most people are to the nice men. And uh, he was uh, sent by Rome here to be the uh, governor over this area. And uh, the Sosthenes, who was the, uh, no doubt, became head of the synagogue after Crispus received Christ. He lost his position as the head of the synagogue or chief of the synagogue. Sosthenes became the chief ruler of the synagogue. They brought Paul before Galileo right here at the judgment seat. This is the Bema seat and uh, where the uh, judgments were made. You're right in the center of the uh, city of Corinth and uh, so this is where Paul would have been brought to stand trial before Galileo. And so uh, as uh, they had brought Paul here to the judgment seat, Bema seat, uh, they said, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, uh, Paul was standing here and he, he started to make his defense and he said, no, 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 no. And he said, if you had brought this fellow here for some evil, if he was a pestilent fellow, if he was creating problems, then, you know, it, justice says I should listen to your case. But if it's just a thing of your religious matters, that's something for you to judge. You know, you see to that. And, and that was a very fair and right judgment. Galileo wasn't here to judge religious matters. He was here to judge the civil uh, situations that took place in the city of Corinth. Now, next to the Bema, Street were, uh, Bema seat were the lictors. And uh, they were the fellows with the canes. And oftentimes, when the judge would give a judgment, it would be a, a caning of the fellow. And so they'd be standing there with their canes, ready to administer the uh, punishment and all uh, upon the person that was uh, judged guilty. And so they, with their canes, drove the Jews out of the judgment seat here. Probably Sosthenes was pressing his point, you know, and, and how that oftentimes they can be forceful and probably, you know, trying to press his point and... Galileo just said to the lictors, have at it. And so they began to beat Sosthenes. And there's where it said, and Galileo cared nothing for it. And, and you, you think, oh, he's just a cruel-hearted guy. I mean, they're beating up this guy, and, and he doesn't do anything about it. And he's supposed to be a judge. But in reality, it was he cared nothing to make judgment on the issue that was brought before him of all uh, violating what they interpreted to be a violation of, of their law. He said, that's something that you should handle. And uh, it wasn't something that he was going to get involved in. And so uh, Paul then stayed here in Corinth for a period of time after that. And they figure that he stayed here for perhaps another six months so that his total time in Corinth was about two years here in Corinth. Now. As Paul wrote his second letter to the Corinthians, he uh, says about, uh, he says there in 2 Corinthians 5th chapter, verse 10, for we shall all appear before the Bema <coughs> seat of Christ, the judgment seat. And, and so he said, uh, I seek to persuade men uh, because we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And in his mind, in the mind of the Corinthians, as they read that, they, this is the place that they were thinking of. The place where the judge would come and uh, give his decrees concerning uh, the people and so forth. And so here we are. Paul was probably standing right somewhere in this area here when uh, Sosthenes brought the charges and, and 
ready to speak up and defend himself. And Ilya said, no, no, no need. Uh, there's, this is not an area, this is not a thing for this court to judge. And uh, dismissed uh, the case immediately. So uh, you can uh, read now the book of Corinthians. And we had a, a, a short uh, kind of a, an analysis and synthesis of 1 Corinthians. We'll get another one of 2 Corinthians uh, before we leave uh, the ship. But uh, you've got the feel of it. You've got the place of it. And whenever you read now of Paul being brought before the judgment seat in Corinth, uh, here we are, right before the judgment seat. So the scripture, again, just has a way of coming alive uh, now in your mind from now on because you'll picture uh, this place and, and it will all just become so real to you as, as you read the scriptures. And, and there will be things as Paul writing to the Corinthians he mentions the immorality and all. And, of course, you do remember uh, how that uh, Paul uh, has, has been told you this was one of the most immoral cities in the world. Uh, of course, it's, a, it's, it's a two ports. Now, usually where you have one naval port, you've got problems. Uh, when you've got two naval ports, you've got real problems. And... Uh, the, the Temple of Aphrodite was on the top of the Acropolis, and every night a thousand uh, priestesses would come down who were nothing more than prostitutes, and their earnings supported uh, the work of the temple on the top of the hill. Uh, an extremely immoral city, and as Paul was writing to the Corinthians, he said, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, the temples and so forth, the adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor the abusers of themselves with mankind, that is the uh, male prostitutes and the homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, drunkards, you know, the Corinthians always pictured as drunkards in the place, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you. I mean, that's where you were until the gospel came. Such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And so, praise God. Sanctified, justified, all through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation. today we better get to our buses so that we can move on to Athens uh, here we are that's wow. awesome yeah, absolutely amen so, is that way or um, I don't know. Um, there's not just the right John Hill. Yeah. Lovely Gwendolyn.
Sure. Give me your jacket.